We are going to pull back and terminate this deal on day one. We're going to reinstate the sanctions that are authorized by Congress that have been waived by this administration to lift them going forward. We're going to go to Congress to put in place even more crippling sanctions going forward. And we're going to go out and convince again, our allies to do it. they've got that. their money. They've already gotten the money. Not every bit of it. Well, they're going to have quite a bit of it, and certainly with the European allies. And, and this is precisely why this deal is so bad. The only reason they were coming to the table was not because the Iranians have suddenly, like, seen the light. This is the same country. I remember as a kid tying yellow ribbons around the tree in front of my house during the 444 days that Iran held 52 Americans hostage. This country has not changed in the past three and a half decades. The reason that this country is at the table is because of two things. One, the sanctions were working, mm -hmm. and they are at their knees and wanted relief, and two, this administration, Barack Obama in the early stages, Hillary Clinton, were pushing for this to happen, even though the president said repeatedly, we're not going to allow this to happen if they're in violation of U.N. Security Council mm -hmm. resolutions. They're in violation of, I believe, at least six. He said you've got to have the ability to have immediate ability to inspect underground facilities like Fort That's not a part of the deal. They said this has got to be a permanent deal. It's not. On all the major things, or nearly all the major things this president said had to be part of the deal, he has moved. He's moved closer and closer to Iran. Why aren't we in a position as great as a country as ours to say, no, you need to come to our position, and then we'll start dealing. So there's no way you'll, let the, let, you'll wait a, six months, a year, to see if the deal's actually no, working? It's a bad deal today. We need to terminate it today. I'm ready to be president of the United States on day one. I don't need to wait a week or a month. I know with the folks that I've talked to, the experts that I've looked at in this deal, the folks from across the political spectrum who know this is a bad deal, I'm ready to make that decision on day one. I'm not going to be intimidated by others around the world. I'm going to make the case on behalf of America and behalf of our allies like Israel, and not just Israel, by the way. The Persian Gulf states overwhelmingly are concerned about this deal with Iran, and it directly affects not just our relationship in the Iran deal, it affects our ability to persuade them to help us in the fight against ISIS, uh, because they see a direct threat. They see a ceding territory to Iran. That makes it more difficult for us in the fight against Iran, Iraq, against uh, ISIS, I should say. The Iraq war, mistake or uh, the right call? Well, the better question is, is not, because knowing what we know now, uh, the bottom line is we don't have the same intelligence. The intelligence is different than we had back then. The better question to ask, not just me, but to ask Hillary Clinton is, why did she and the president know? What, were they given military advice about not to pull out as rapidly as they did? Why did they make the decision to pull out as quickly as they did in Iraq, which military expert after expert said would open the door? President Bush signed that agreement, though. But it's a bad deal. It's All right. A, it's a, I mean, we for should, what it's worth, this, we, was, a, we this should, was a bipartisan. But this is, and, and I'm free to credit, I think the Bush administration spent far too much money, and I'm willing to call that out. And I think the North Korean deal the Bush administration right. was a part of is precisely why the Iran deal is such a bad deal. We're sitting here today worried about what's happening with nuclear weapons, many of which are, are missiles directed potentially at U.S. territory in North Korea. It's precisely why that deal is a bad deal. And when it comes to Iraq, we shouldn't have pulled out this early. It's opened the door and the vacuum has been filled by ISIS. I would lift the political restrictions on the military person already there, give them the ability to work with our Kurd and Sunni allies, and that will help us reclaim the territory taken there. Do you believe ISIS would be the threat it is today if we had not gone into Iraq? Well, I, I think that's highly debated. I, mean, I think the bottom line is ISIS feeds off of this feeling. There's a caliphate out there that feeds off of jihadist militants mm -hmm. coming from around the world to places like Syria and elsewhere that believe that they're driven by the strength of their success. America's position that we have under the Obama-Clinton doctrine is leading from behind. And that only feeds into this belief that they're winning. We need to send the opposite message, that we're drawing a line, that America will not be intimidated. I certainly won't be intimidated. Now is not the time to go with untested leadership. And that's what we get if we go on the path like we did with Barack Obama, putting someone in office who's never led anything in government. Before. Let me go back to what's the answer here? We've tried toppling leaders in Iraq and Libya. We've tried drone strikes. That seems to create more terrorists. We've pulled back. We've gone in. Nothing seems to stop this issue of Islamic terrorism. What is it, what are you going to do differently that is somehow going to solve this problem? Well, different from this president and from the policy that Hillary Clinton was involved with is lifting the political restrictions and the personnel already there. I'll give you a good example. We have people in Iraq right now in the military, over 3,000 troops. It's not a question of sending more and it's about empowering them to unleash the power of the United States military. We have people right there as air controllers who could literally draw in airstrikes with absolute precision. They can't do that. That's particularly difficult because I, I talked to a general earlier this year who said 
airstrikes can be effective, but right now they're like a drizzle. He said, we need to have a thunderstorm there. But with all the different parties, with all the different... So you would increase airstrikes. What about ground troops? I, I think you empower the military personnel like these spotters, like these... We saw with the, the mm -hmm. folks that were embedded in the surge, the very effective tools to empower the Iraqis, the Kurdish uh, allies that we have, the Sunni tribal leaders that we have there. All those forces are in a position, if we give them the help by lifting those political restrictions, to go in and allow them, empower them, the people actually in Iraq, to reclaim so that territory. you don't territory. think we need new additional... Uh, well, I think we, we need to lift those restrictions first. Okay. We, we should never do what this president has done. We should never signal to our enemy how far we're willing to go or what period of time we're going to do, or they'll just wait us out. But I can guarantee you, I can guarantee the American people that if I'm commander in chief, I will never make a decision about the use of force that isn't driven by military decisions, as opposed to what I see under this administration, which are things largely driven by political and bureaucratic considerations. We need to assess lifting that, how effective that is, and then work with our military leaders to see what's the effective next course. All right, let me uh, move on here. There's a perception that uh, you've switched your positions on a few issues, on immigration, uh, that you've said, I'm that you've admitted. On. Actually, yeah. listen to the American people. I think most Americans would say, we want a so president you, you, who's... You were for a pathway to citizenship, and now you're not. Yeah, I was a governor who had next to no involvement in it and made some All statements right. on it. Today, I, I've said after the past year, listening to people and, and actually joining the lawsuit last November, that was probably the last straw. I and 24 other governors went after the president because he said 22 times in the past he couldn't do what he did on illegal immigration. He went out and did it. I went to court along with Greg Abbott and a bunch of other governors to stop him. I looked at how messed up that was, listened to other governors and other legislative and other leaders right. from border states, and most importantly, listened to the American people. Well, death penalty, that's another one. From uh, our standpoint, I, I've, I've said simple. I, I've said I, I'm supported death penalty based on DNA evidence, which we didn't have years ago when the issue first came up. And uh, ethanol subsidies, where you're I, for them in Iowa, but you're not for them in, in Wisconsin. No, I've never been for them in, New, in Wisconsin. I've said I, I opposed them when I ran. Right, I know you opposed them in Wisconsin. That, that's, but in Iowa, though, you've backed no, off no, of no, that opposition. That's not true. In Wisconsin, we don't have them today. If I was for them, we'd have them in Wisconsin. The difference is... The, reform, the, the standard that they have nationally is one I said you can't eliminate on day one because there's a whole industry there that's based on it. I've said in Iowa, I said it at the state fair on top of the soapbox. So I'm not saying anything different mm -hmm. to you today than I said in Iowa itself. They need to be phased out over the next couple of years as well as all the that other. That comes across, though, as you're pandering to Iowa. No, it's saying if you, drew the, if you took the, the, the rug out from anything right now, you'd devastate an industry that's built on it. What they need is market access. You allow that to happen over the next couple of years. I, I want to take a whole bunch of standards and mandates, not just the renewable fuel standard, a whole bunch of others out there and do it. What that comes across as is a governor who actually understands how things work. This isn't just about a litmus test of issues. This is about understanding how people really live in their lives and an eye when it comes to the ag community. Mm -hmm. Something I, will, I know well coming from an ag state is you can't just pull the rug out, but I don't believe long term it should be there. That's why my guide was to do it over the next couple of years. And then there was the comment you made at the end of the 2014 on same-sex marriage. You said, for us, meaning Wisconsin, the debate is over. Now, now you've said that's not the Again, case. Again, it's not right. That was then. You said, for us, it's over. At the time, it was a judge who had overturned and it, said... It was marriage. over in terms of our legal options. We had no other option other than waiting to see what the Supreme Court did. If I'd said anything differently, I'd be, I'd be misguiding the people of Wisconsin. There was no other option for the state of Wisconsin. That for could more, be interpreted, though, as you're saying, you know what, I've, well, it's over. The debate that, is over. If you but it wasn't just way, you, then you're wrong. But a lot of voters may have. No, I don't think so at all. No? People have known for 20 years. I voted for a, a defining marriage as between one man and one woman as a state lawmaker. I supported my constitution nearly a decade ago. I took it all the way through the legal process, all the way to asking the Supreme Court to bring it up. They denied that ability to the state of Wisconsin. Instead, they waited for the decisions we heard about earlier this summer. So it's pretty clear what my position is. And I think going forward, I believe that states should have the right to define marriage under the law, that that is something that is constitutional. But I believe for the president going forward, the most immediate thing the next president should be involved, I'll certainly be involved in, is protecting people's religious liberties. That's something that's inherent in the Constitution. It's part of the Bill of Rights. It's why so many of our founders came to America, was to be free of a religious person. Right. What does that mean? Does that mean a business could fire somebody? Um, that, that that's means, gay? That means... Just because they're gay? That means... Well, that means you have to have that balance up. That means making sure that we uphold the Constitution, which says you have the freedom of religion, not freedom from religion, the freedom of religion. And that means, I'll just speak about it, our Justice Department, our IRS and others out there, 
uh, will uphold that. For most cases, what it's likely to mean is protecting religious institutions uh, like churches, like synagogues, like organizations, like schools and others there that I think are very, very concerned today in light of the decisions. So it's possible under religious, uh, using freedom of religion, that you think that a, um, a business could fire somebody. No, I think for being I angry. think the best examples are in Wisconsin. We have explicit language in our state's constitution. We also have language against discrimination. It has worked for years. Mm -hmm. I don't get all the fuss elsewhere around the country. Look at what we've done in Wisconsin. We do a very good job of clearly stating in our, our state constitution that we protect people's religious liberties. It has worked year after year after year. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have very clear language and have for some time that prohibits discrimination. We've been able to find that balance out there, and I think that's something people are going to expect out of the next president. You know, one of the things I was surprised doing some research was that uh, African Americans uh, in the state of Wisconsin, there's a higher incarceration rate in the state of Wisconsin for African American men than anywhere in the country. Uh, there was a study that said African American children in Wisconsin rank 50th in the nation when it comes to uh, when it comes to opportunity, and African American unemployment is double the national average. Why is that? Well, it's a sad truth that's been true for decades. And part of it is, I think, some of the poor policies in the city of Milwaukee. We pushed back on it. You look at the Milwaukee uh, public school systems had a real challenge. One of the big uh, disparities has been, amongst many others in the country, has been there. It's part of the reason why I've been such an advocate long before I was governor for school choice, to give African-American and Latino and other families the ability to get beyond some of the school, schools in those neighborhoods that weren't living up to those standards. It's why, as governor, I put in place major reforms that empower not just Milwaukee, but the 423 other school districts to go out and do reforms. That I feel get like this is on Milwaukee? There's not much more you could have done? Well, I mean, right now, it's one of those where we've, we've done all sorts of things. In fact, we put hundreds of millions of dollars in to try and help rebuild the economy out there. But again, you've got to have leaders that are willing to use the tools that we've given them. Um, those are things that we're committed to. And as president, I'm going to try and empower cities, towns, villages of all different sizes around this country to have more freedom and more liberties to do things without the restrictions from Washington and out without some of the restrictions that you've seen. One of the biggest areas of big government union control has come in places like Milwaukee, which have been abysmal failure. I remember years ago, one of the examples I gave was Milwaukee, a year before I was elected governor, had a reduction in aid from the state government when Democrats controlled everything. Mm. One of the first people to be laid off was someone who had just been announced as the outstanding new English teacher of the year for the entire state, exactly the kind of teacher you'd want in, in a district that has the challenges like it does in Milwaukee. She was one of the first laid off because under the old union contracts, under the old collective bargaining before my reforms, the last hired was the first fired. The last in was the first out. Our reforms have opened the door in school districts like Milwaukee, not only in my state, but others across the country, hopefully can use those reforms to do a better job of providing a quality education. Quality education, trying to do more to strengthen families, providing more training and opportunity, not just in K through 12, but beyond for people to get into the workforce, and then helping make sure that there are more jobs by unleashing the power of the private sector to get government out of the way. Those are the things that will help not only Milwaukee, but across the country. Uh, let me close with this. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, a newspaper that endorsed you in 2010 and endorsed you in 2012, recently called you among the most divisive politicians in, in living memory. We have a Washington here, I'll be honest with you, it's hopelessly divided and polarized and partisan. How do you somehow be the guy that unites it? A lot of people are sitting there saying, well, Scott Walker's not gonna be able to uh, make Washington less polarizing. What do you say you to that? You know what Americans want more than anything? They want Washington to work. It, it, coming together, working across party lines, we, we've seen for decades in this city that politicians on both sides, I might argue more Democrats and Republicans on both sides, have largely worked together in ignoring the debt and deficit problems of the country. They've ignored some of the big challenges that are on the horizon for my children and the other children and, and those yet to come out there. So just working across party lines, if it doesn't mean getting things done, is not what Americans are looking for. What they're looking for are leaders that actually get things done. And sure, did I get some pushback? Yeah, because I came in and said, instead of talking about things, I'm going to get right to work and I'm going to start fixing things. Mm -hmm. Most politicians talk about things, but they don't fix them. I fixed things and didn't talk about them. What I've learned going forward, yeah, I admit my mistakes. You've got to do both. You've got to talk about it. You've got to constantly explain to people what's at stake, what's at risk, what do we need to do to help future generations as opposed to just future elections. And that's what we did. And sometimes the status quo defenders don't like that. They're not going to like that a lot in Washington. But I don't care, and that may mean even some of the leaders of my own party, but I'm willing to push back on that because I think Americans now more than ever want someone who's going to fight 
but who's going to fight and win for them, who's actually going to get results, do it without compromising principles. I think now more than ever, we need a leader in America who's actually been tested because we see how bad it's been when you have someone who wasn't. That's the kind of leader I'll be. All right.